out to me, and I can see that that one is scheduled for you. Um, hopefully everyone signed in, and if you did not hear about this, just a fun um, email from us, and we wanted to add it to everyone's email address in case they didn't get it. Um, okay, housekeeping for you. For those of you asking about your um, we are going to record the presentation part, but this is meant to be a casual um, networking type presentation for you, so don't feel like you have to eat your diet or anything. And um, if you have questions, we're going to do a QA and a session at the end, and we are not going to record that um, at this time, so this is just sort of like a um, network session for you to have um, if you have questions or anything like that. Okay, good. But um, is that good to be yeah, at the end? Yeah, perfect. All right. Um, just because it's a relatively good sized group, really quick, we everyone knows who's in the room will go around and just say their name. Thank you. Today is Cameron Atkinson. He's a master's student at Colorado State University. He's going to be talking to y'all about um, current and current today with um, a whole bunch of interns as well as um, some families and things like that. Um, prior to that, he did some work um, as a junior college student in Georgia with Living Shoreline Research as well as another um, student in Sweden. Thank you for that introduction, and it's good to be here seeing a lot of familiar faces. Um, during that time I was at the College of Coastal Georgia, I actually got the chance to spend the summer interning here at CRD, so it's good to be back here and see a lot of familiar faces and some new ones, and excited to share a little bit about what I've been doing the last couple of years as part of my master's thesis. So as um, was mentioned, I'm a little interested in oyster reefs and oyster reef restoration and how we can potentially improve that here along the coast of Georgia. and so. Kind of starting out, it's important to recognize, you know, why are we interested in oyster reefs and why I restore them. And so kind of the big buzzword is that they do a lot of different ecosystem services. So we're real familiar with their ability to filter out the water and um, kind of improve the water quality. But there's also a big implication with um, fish habitat and the value associated with oyster reefs in terms of them provisioning habitat for fish as well as kind of contributing directly to the commercial fishery as well as to kind of a sport fishing community as well. And um, due to the historic loss of oyster reefs and oyster densities, it's kind of led to that need for uh, restoration. And so thinking about oyster restoration here in Georgia, CRD has done a great job and put a lot of, of effort and money into different resources like, um, I don't know if I had the pointer, but buying a barge like this that was actually very influential in helping us out build our reefs that I'll get it to in, in a minute. But kind of the traditional approach for restoration is using um, wooden pallets and stacking uh, bags of oyster shell on top and kind of setting them out like you're, like you're seeing down here by the CRD group. And um, it's, it's worked in some cases and there have been some concerns with it and kind of one of the concerns is that relic shell is becoming less available and there's not as much shell um, around to do restoration. And due to the lack of shell and you know just simple uh, supply and demand, there's less of it so the cost is going up. There's also some concern with the, with the bags that there may be potential microplastic pollution as those bags kind of degrade over time. And uh, a big concern in a lot of areas is sedimentation, which is with our uh, energetic en environment here in estuaries and kind of the soft mud. A lot of times you can have 
these reefs being covered up with sediment before they can actually take hold and grow into a, a mature reef. And so this picture here is a reef that was done, I believe by the CRD group. It's a picture I've had from a while, but you can see along the bottom here is the edge of a uh, wooden pallet with those shell bags and the mud has completely covered it up. Uh, and that's something that is relatively common along the coast and potential for some concern for restoration projects um, going forward. So due to that, there is a kind of a need to identify some potential other uh, substrates and mechanisms to restoring oysters along the coast to hopefully kind of improve restoration here on the coast to get those oysters back and get those ecosystem services that have potentially been lost due to those declines. I'm sorry, can, can you maybe turn this thing down? I'm getting an echo and I don't, and I don't hear well or something. But okay. It's a, uh, If you need to turn it off, I can talk loud too, whatever's best. Is that better? Yeah, so as I was saying, um, there is kind of a need to look at some potential other alternative substrates that could work here in Georgia to hopefully improve restoration and going forward and have a better, bigger impact with the money and the dollars that are put into restoration. So one of those substrates and the one that we're particularly interested in our study is a, is a substrate called Oyster Catcher. It's produced by a company up in North Carolina called the Sandbar Oyster Company. And it uh, features plant-based fibers, so jute fibers that are basically dipped in the cement and then wet formed into different shapes. And so I've kind of included a no number of pictures here kind of showing the different kind of structures that this material can be made into. Um, we're, for our project, we're using these oyster catcher tables. So they look like a little coffee table, if you can imagine. You can go out and press them down in the mud. but. Able to make them into a bunch of different designs, as, as you can see here. And it's not been tested yet in Georgia, but it has seen some success in Virginia, North Carolina, and Florida. So for our project, this is kind of the alternative substrate we're looking at, and the tr more traditional substrate being uh, the bag shell. So really two kind of overarching objectives with this study. And the first is just simply to look at the growth and development of oyster reefs over time and see how these two substrates are comparing to each other as well as how they compare to natural reefs. Uh, and then similarly with the uh, second point is looking at necton use, seeing how these, these, uh, re these restored reefs are provisioning habitat and how they're doing that compared to natural reefs. So for our project, we have um, six reefs that we built back in May of 2021. And we made three bag shell reefs as well as three oyster catcher reefs. And all these reefs are located along the shoreline of the Skidaway Island State Park. So they're all located here. This is the Skidaway River here with the state park located there and then the um, bridge crossing over um, onto the island there. And if you uh, frequent that area with a boat, this is a uh, Rodney J. Hall boat ramp or Butterbean Beach as it's more well known around Savannah. And we also selected um, three nearby natural reefs to serve as reference sites for the different data collection we did throughout the study. So here I just kind of have a, a collage of some uh, different pictures kind of showing the process we, we took to get the materials ready as well as um, really shout out and thank uh, the help of a number of different folks. So this kind of up top is the bag shell section. So we had a couple different uh, bag shell events where we had volunteers come out and we were helped out uh, greatly by Cameron Brenton with, with CRD as well as some other folks that allowed us to actually borrow their little shell bagging hopper that was you know, really useful and helped us out a lot to, to bag um, quite a few bags there. Uh, once those bags were made, we then loaded them up on pallets. And then once again, thanks to CRD, we had their barge here that they were able to bring up for us and we were able to load those pallets onto that barge and then carry them out to the restoration site. And then um, had to get a little bit creative with transporting the oyster catcher materials um, down from North Carolina. So we actually uh, drove up and got a U-Haul here as well as a trailer in our own uh, work truck, loaded it all up, brought it down. And actually, I don't have a picture of it. I couldn't find one, but back to the U-Haul uh, down the boat ramp and loaded the materials out of the U-Haul into the boat. And this is us carrying them over and then handing them off and this putting them down into the mud. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to show kind of what that process looked like and as well as kind of thanking the help we got from a number of folks throughout the, the process of building the reefs. So in terms of um, where we were going to place these reefs, it was important to us that we didn't just go out and willy-nilly place them at different points along the shoreline. We wanted to kind of get an idea in terms of elevation along the shoreline where the best spot is to put the reef. So, we um, were fortunate enough to have the help of uh, Dr. Clark Alexander's group at um, Skidaway, and Mike Robinson was able to come out with us, and we borrowed their RTK unit, 
and surveyed some pre-existing reefs and were able to collect uh, elevation values of those pre-existing reefs nearby. And then we're able to um, walk a transect at our restoration sites and collect elevation data. And, and we were able to kind of uh, correlate the distance from the shoreline as well as that elevation value to then go out and place some PVC poles that marked our reef sites when we went out with Cameron with the barge and had the material as well as with the uh, oyster catcher material to know where to place it at high tide. So here is kind of a first look of what these reefs look like right after they were built. So this is our back shell reef, as you can see here on the pallets, as I mentioned, is what's commonly done. And then a oyster catcher reef right after construction. And also included just a picture of one of our natural reef sites that we use as a, a reference for the study. So uh, in terms of, of sampling, the, the, the kind of the first bit is looking at the oysters and oyster reef growth and development, as I mentioned. And so with oyster sampling, we do that quarterly. And um, each sampling event, we have kind of three quadrats we put out, uh, three different sections of the reef, the lower, middle, and upper sections of the reef uh, at each of our nine different reefs we monitor. And in those quadrats, we, we count spat um, as well as measure them. We, use a rugosity, we measure rugosity just using a small gauge chain to look at kind of reef complexity. And then also something that we've had a little bit of trouble with, with our um, UAS, our drone program at Savannah State, we've had planned to collect aerial survey and, and um, ele like looking at lateral vertical growth metrics over time using a drone. We had some issues with that, but luckily um, Clark Alexander's group again and Claudia is fortunate enough to be here today. She is helping us out greatly to be able to um, come out in the next month or so and actually fly the reefs and, and get some data. Not the long-term change we wanted to see, but it's still good to have that data to look at some um, lateral and vertical uh, metrics of, of the reef themselves. So diving into some of the, the numbers here, first looking at oyster density, um, kind of looking here over time and across our, I guess, four different um, sampling events that we've done now. Up top here and with the triangles, you have the oyster catcher reefs, um, with the squares, you have the natural reefs, and then the circles, you have bag shell. So generally seeing a upward trend minus kind of this initial drop you saw, and a lot of that's probably just, we had a lot of spat that initially recruited, and into that first winter, some of that spat kind of recited, didn't potentially survive, just with the nature of having a lot of juveniles more susceptible to different uh, environmental events but begin seeing that rebound over time. And then here is just a, a graph of mean oyster density across our three reef types at our latest sampling events. This was in, in June of 2022. And as you can see, the oyster catcher reef type is, you know, having, they are experiencing a lot more density and there's a lot more uh, dense reefs for oyster catcher reefs as compared to the bag shell and uh, natural reefs. I think it is worth mentioning though that these bag shell reefs are starting to increase in their density. It's just not at the rate as uh, at the initial recruitment as well as the subsequent recruitment the second year as um, the oyster catcher reefs. They're, they're tending to fare a lot better. Then looking at the um, oyster links, as you can see over time here, starting at the top, this is just the natural reefs and they're, you know, relatively consistent over time. And then kind of this upward trend as the oysters begin to grow. Here though is the oyster catcher reefs and they are growing much quicker and have oyster shells that are getting a lot bigger faster which is important because those shells are growing more complexity for the reef and kind of helping to get those reefs off the ground and away from some of that sediment that's been of some concern in the past. And this is just a graph of mean um, oyster length for the adult oysters that is not the spat uh, at our latest um, sampling event last June and as you can see the Oyster catcher, um, the mean length of the oyster catcher, oysters are nearing the length of the natural oysters as well. And uh, bag shell at, at this point is actually significantly smaller. The, the, the oysters at those reefs are significantly smaller than the, re than the oysters at the oyster catcher and natural reef sites. So then rugosity, just a measure of kind of the complexity, structural complexity of those reefs. Um, kind of a interesting trend here, and I did want to point that out and explain why is, okay, so why is there such a big drop as the oyster density is growing? And a lot of this drop is associated with, if you saw those pictures of those tables, and when I show you a picture again here shortly, maybe you can see it, but there's 
some gaps in between the tables when you place them down. So we had kind of had to work through how we were going to sample that with the rugosity chain, how we were going to stretch that down to the mud, or if we were going to lay it down flat. And ultimately, we decided to put that down to the mud. And what ended up happening during the second sampling event is that the oysters actually had grown in enough to kind of fill in those gaps in that short amount of time, which ended up dropping the rugosity value down um, just simply because the chain wasn't, you weren't incorporating that drop down to, to the mud. So that's kind of an interesting drop there, but also I wanted to explain that, but it really is kind of a more of a function of the fact that there's more shell and more oysters growing in and filling in the gaps between the kind of the, the non-living structure and then the kind of the new living structure of the oyster shell. And then looking at the mean rugosity values here, it's kind of similar to um, the density information is that oyster catcher reefs are tending to have a higher rugosity compared to the um, natural reefs. And that's just simply showing that these oyster catcher reefs potentially have more structural complexity, which is important for the survival and continual growth of that reef over time, reef, reef over time but also as we get into some of the fish and necton stuff, leads to better fish habitat potentially. So here I just kind of have some um, pictures to kind of walk through from each of those, I guess, four sampling events starting three months after the reefs were built. And fortunately, I didn't do a great job at the start of getting a picture from the same angle, so they're kind of pieced together, but I think it does kind of show uh, how the reefs developed over time. So starting off in September of 2021 on the left here, then leading into December. So kind of the biggest change here, the, kind of the, the start, there wasn't a lot of oysters, you know, pretty small, obviously, as they're just recruiting, and most of the oysters are recruiting here in this lower section. This is kind of more pronounced into December, where not many oysters at all have really survived or even recruited up in this upper part of the reef, as well as some mud already starting to creep in and cover up the pallets, and then most of the oysters here along the uh, channel side of the reef. Into March, into 2022, the reefs, the backshell reefs started to actually look a lot better with a little bit concerned going into the end of that 2021 period that the backshell reefs really weren't going to take hold much, but it started to do a little bit better into 2022 and so starting to fill out the reef, um, but still most of the shell are up close and this is even more pronounced into last month in our last sampling event. Decent bit of shell there along the uh, toe of the reef, kind of toward the channel of the, of the, of the water. Um, and then really pronounced is kind of the back part of this reef is getting, you know, about this back half of this pallet is pretty much completely covered with mud at this point. We've even seen some bags be completely covered, as well as some bags that have either been knocked off by people or boats or something like that. This is right near a walking trail of the state park, so somebody maybe came out there and uh, took the privilege of moving the bags. Not sure what happened there, but that's kind of the story of the bag shell reef. So here is just right post-construction what they look like, and then about a month ago is what they look like. And we were out at low tide the, on Monday this week, and they look pretty similar. So um, kind of a, a view of what, how that's changed over time and how, they, how those bag shell reefs have developed. And then same thing here with the oyster catcher reefs. Um, First, you know, first sampling event here, a lot of smaller oysters, you know, d decent number of oysters, pretty encouraging initial recruitment. And then into December, you know, the reef filling out more. Um, still getting similar to the bag shell reefs, but most of the oysters are in this kind of lower or channel side section of the reef. But you get some decent recruitment all throughout, especially here on the legs, are a big part of, big point of recruitment. And then into March, the reefs are really starting to fill out, um, pretty uniform length throughout the reefs, as well as density. Uh, not so much of an effect of kind of this lower section recruiting moisture versus the upper section of the reef. And then here in June, the reefs have really filled out, um, pretty much no gaps at all between the, the tables here. They're starting to really close in. The oyster shell, as I mentioned, is starting to get pretty big, um, very similar to the size of the natural oysters we're seeing at nearby reefs, so pretty encouraging. And then here, once again, is a start to finish. Um, and so this actually is the same reef. I did a decent job, I guess, getting a picture of the same one. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't for some of the other time periods, but 
You can see here, I mean, it's pretty stark difference in how the, how the reefs, of, these oyster catcher reefs have kind of developed and, and, and grown over time. So we're encouraged um, by that and seeing that, uh, those results, both visually as well as in the numbers that I went through a while back or a few minutes ago. Then to just kind of conclude these comparisons, here is uh, what the bag shell reefs look like currently compared to the oyster catcher reefs. So just kind of a visual representation of some of those numbers that and those uh, trends on those graphs that I was just showing. So now in, into the kind of the second objective, looking at how fish, crabs, and shrimp are utilizing uh, the reef habitats that we constructed, as well as those natural reefs nearby. And kind of first, I divided this into two sections. Uh, the first is traditional gear, and then we'll get into some technology we're using. But we also have a a volunteer angler study that we're doing alongside to kind of engage some anglers and look at how some of the sport fish are utilizing these reefs as well. I'm not going to talk about that today, but starting off looking at our traditional gear, and we sample with that monthly, and those gear types are crab traps, minnow traps, and gill nets. So stuff that's utilized kind of by a number of different groups. And so what we do is go out at high tide events and place that gear, gear out for four hours and let that soak. And go in and sample, and go in and pull that gear up, and, and collect or count our our catch as well as as measure those individuals and weigh them. So we have three different crab traps we put out at each reef, six minnow traps, and we put out one gill net at each reef. And those nets are 10 meters long. And we have a one inch and two inch stretch mesh that that net is divided between. So just starting off, just some. I guess summary statistics with some of the stuff we've caught, or I guess the amount of stuff and total individuals we've caught. And so I won't bore you with the numbers, but you can see here that um, all the numbers, we, the number of grams of fish that we've caught, and, and, and crabs and shrimp I should include. And these are kind of different here. A lot of this, and it's unique, is that we've, a lot of these natural reefs, particularly and in the last few months, the bag shell has shot up with landings is because we've been catching a lot of sharks and gar that are really just getting tangled up in our nets. So we wanted to include that, but that's a lot of what is happening there. And then uh, here, just looking at total individuals, um, see our, our restored reef types are pretty similar there in terms of total individuals collected, with our natural reefs being a little bit lower in terms of that. And so now looking at, at catch per unit effort, and I did this a, a couple of ways. First, looking at uh, looking at grams per hour, so how much fish we're catching per time period. And uh, once again, with the large error bars here over our time series, a lot of that's associated with those sharks and gar that we don't really get too terribly often, but they do come into play, particularly at our natural reefs, um, is something of note, I believe, looking at that and seeing how we are seeing those larger fish getting tangled up at natural reefs and even the bag shell reefs, but maybe not quite as much at our oyster catcher reefs at this point. Um, and then looking at kind of just the mean catch per unit effort for the three different reef types, there's not a significant difference there, but generally the natural reefs are is higher compared to the bag shell and oyster catcher with oyster catcher um, being the lowest value there. And then uh, another way I looked at catch per unit effort is just individuals per hour. And so basically just the number of individuals that we collect over that time period. And here there's more uniformity in terms of the air bars as well as it really shows just we catch most of our fish in the summer months and into the fall and then it kind of drops down into the winter time. And a lot of that is contributed to more of the schooling fish we're catching. So our menhaden or kind of smaller schools of, of mullet, white mullet in particular, we're catching some decent sized schools of that are driving up the um, individuals we're collecting during the summer months when they're uh, more abundant in the estuary for what we're sampling. And then here, um, catch per unit effort for individuals per hour, the mean is pretty similar between all three, to be honest. And there's, you know, the oyster catcher is highest, followed by bag shell. Um, but, you know, it. it it did actually be, end up being that the restored reef types were significantly greater than the natural reefs for um, this metric. Then looking at, at fish lengths, and the majority of the fish we're, we're seeing are between 100 and 300 uh, millimeters total length. That's just simply due to the size mesh we're using with our gill nets. And we are seeing some of these larger fish, as I mentioned before, and you can kind of see the split off here that happens 
that is where our larger fish that are just getting tangled and not actually being captured in the net themselves are coming into play, but those are included. And then in terms of, of mean total length, the restored reef is our similar size fish. Um, with the natural reef being a little bit bigger, but there was no significant difference there in terms of that, the mean length between the reef type. And also with our crab traps, looking at, at blue crabs, um, very similar in terms of mean length or mean width, I should say, across all the reef types. Very similar with most of our um, blue crabs coming in between 100 and 175 millimeters, and I think about 80 to 85 percent of them being males that we're we're collecting during the study. Then looking at um, some of the species diversity as well as species richness information. Um, Pretty similar between the three different reef types for the Shannon Winter Diversity Index with the natural reefs being slightly higher than the uh, restored reef types. And we have seen 29 different species at the bag shell reefs, 30 at the oyster catcher, as well as 30 at the natural. So pretty similar there in terms of the number of different unique species we've seen at each of the reefs and reef, reef types. And here I've just included a list of all the different species we've caught and kind of their percent of the catch. So our five uh, most commonly caught organisms are Atlantic menhaden, white shrimp, blue crab, spot, and striped mullet. Those are the things we run into a lot. And you can feel free to read all the different stuff that we've, we've caught so far. I think there actually may be, from our July sampling data, I haven't got that information in yet. I think we may be added a couple new species, so that's exciting. So kind of the second part of the Necton sampling that I wanted to talk about today was using a technology acoustic imaging. So if anyone's familiar with the use of Didson technology, this is kind of the new version of that. And it's using a camera, a sonar camera called the Aris Explorer 1800. We are fortunate enough to borrow that from a group up at East Carolina, Dr. Jim Morley's group up there. And we've had the chance to take it out four or five times now, four sampling events now, and, and use it to count fish and, 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 and measure fish even at our reefs, as well as kind of just observe some of the behavior that they're doing at those reef sites at um, high tide whenever um, we put the imagery out there and can actually see some video, and we'll have that shortly. And so for this sampling, we take 10, uh, we take 10 minute little chunks of video and we only look at the last eight minutes of that video. This allows kind of a two minute buffer to allow us to get in and out of the water so that water kind of, everything kind of stabilized. And then in that eight minute, last eight minute period, we randomly select 48 frames. There's, we have an R um, uh, file that allows us to go in there and randomly select frames. And each of these frames are no closer than 30 frames apart. That way we're trying to not look at the same fish over and over again and get a better sample of uh, the whole time period. And something we ran into, and this is pretty common talking to some, some folks that have done this, is that schooling fish are pretty tough to work with. And so we have these big old schools in Midhaven that come through and other little schooling fish, and they get so clumped up that you can't really measure them. So I include this image here showing kind of in post-processing how you can go and measure fish. This is actually a total length measurement. And then whenever they get so clumped up, you can count the fish to the best of your ability. Um, but there's really no good way of measuring them because it's really just a big glob of, of fish. And we'll see that here shortly in a video. This is kind of our setup. We can go place it out and, and view on a tablet that we have out in the field. Here's just a little diagram of what sampling with this technology looks like. So we had a tripod that was manufactured that we were actually can attach the camera housing onto and place it out in the water. And on the uh, software and the tablet, we're able to actually dial in the camera to get some pretty good, get the best image quality. And then once we have got it set up and got our good image quality, this is kind of what it will look like. So this is a oyster catcher table reef. So you can see the tables there. And it's kind of the, the view we're looking for uh, whenever we're getting it set up. And so I'll go straight into a video of an example of what this looks like. So at the very beginning there, at the bottom here, you saw a little bonnet head shark come through. And this is an example of what the Atlantic Menhaden can look like coming through there pretty thick, casting a big shadow behind. And they continue to go through. There's their big shadow. Then in a second, in this area, there's going to be some smaller 
kind of medium sized fish that are going to start swimming through. So here they come. And throughout, there's some other fish up on the reef there. So pretty neat imagery. Can get it kind of get a view underwater in some pretty murky waters that you know you can't really get with some with other cameras. This sonar camera allows us to do that. Allows us to count those fish, measure those fish, uh, as well as we didn't really do any work in, in this project with behavior, but there is some opportunities to do some behavior studies with with fish and how they're utilizing different habitats um, using that technology. So here looking at kind of the abundance data associated with the ARIS. I also have included with all this some of the gill net abundance data just to kind of put it into context of what we're seeing with the traditional um, sampling gear. So um, generally kind of the trend is that at both the ARIS and the gill net that we're getting higher abundance values at the restored reef types and um, here in both cases the oyster catcher um, reefs are seeing higher abundance of fish. And there is some pretty big error bars here associated with this event, and that was because we had some fish that were smaller, but we actually were able to measure them, and so we didn't want to throw those out and, gl and group them into the schooling fish because we were actually able to measure them. And so what I did was I went back and looked at some of our, our catch data from our gill net, and we had caught a bunch of white mullet and mama chug during those events, and so likely that's what contributed to that was just having a school or two of these mama chug or white mullet swimming through that we were able to measure and include it. So then looking at the um, links, kind of similar trend in terms of the one, one being better than the other in terms of natural and restored. So there's higher links associated with the natural reefs in both cases, for both the ARIS and the gillnet sampling. Um, but there is a flip-flop here between the bag shell having higher links at the ARIS opposed to the oyster catcher having higher links for the um, gillnet. And so up until recently, actually, the, the trend associated here was the same way where they were flip-flopped, but there is some mirroring now with some newer, with new, some newer data that we've got. But no real significant difference between the reef types here with, with fish length um, across both of those sampling techniques. And then looking at a length frequency distribution, a um, couple things I wanted to point out um, with the ARIS length frequency is a pretty nice normal distribution here that's not as prevalent with the gill net length frequency. And also, I like to point out too, just notice the scale here on the uh, y-axis is a whole order of magnitude greater for the ARIS sampling. And I think that's worth noting, you know, in an, in an eight minute sampling window we're using, so a lot smaller sampling window opposed to a roughly four hour window for the gill net, seeing a lot more fish and uh, potentially getting a, a, a good view, a better view of the fish that are actually out there um, compared to the gill net sampling, which is a lot more intensive time-wise and takes a lot more man hours to do. So that's uh, a pretty neat observation. And um, once again here with the gill nets, you're seeing the split off of those fish that are getting tangled. And we, you know, did see sharks and gar that were swimming through. I mean, you saw it in the video, that bonnet head shark that was swimming through. But for whatever reason, with our random frame selection for our, for our process of analyzing the ARIS imagery, we really didn't get in many frames with big fish in there. So we know they were out there, but we, they were not included in that analysis. So that was an interesting thing. I think there was only one fish that was greater than 600 millimeters total length that was observed in the ARIS footage. So I did want to, to point that out as well. So kind of in conclusion, the, the big messages here and the big things that we're seeing is that the oyster catcher reefs are developing quicker than the bag shell reefs and they've uh, been pretty successful, which could be a uh, means to look at oyster catcher substrate as a restoration substrate here going forward for restoration in Georgia due to some of the success that, that we've seen. And I include this picture here. And it's kind of tough. That's my head, and it. it's hard to get a picture. So this is actually underneath one of the oyster catcher tables. And so one thing you're getting with these oyster catcher tables that we're not really able to quantify as well is that underneath the tables is a lot of surface area for recruitment as well. And so really we're only sampling the top part of the tables and the legs. And so there's a lot, really the numbers could be a lot more different, a lot more drastic if you were able to destructively sample these reefs which some groups are doing, we decided not to. 
and get a look at what's happening underneath these tables as well. I mean, you can see that there's quite a bit of oysters that are underneath the tables as well. So I wanted to include that picture to kind of frame that comment that with what we're seeing, the oyster catcher reefs are seemingly doing better, but they could potentially be doing even better than what we're observing because of what's happening at the under part of the reef in that extra surface area. And then kind of the second big take home message is that both restored reef types, both natural and oyster catcher, are appearing to um, provision habitat at rates that are similar to the natural reefs, which is encouraging. Uh, and just in general, the general trend is that we have bigger or greater fish abundances at the restored reefs and bigger fish at the natural reefs. But as the, pro as the project's kind of gone on and we've got more data, those trends have came more and more closer together and not as pronounced and not uh, statistically significant. So um, with that, that's kind of the big message and the big story of, I guess, the two big stories associated with our research at Savannah State. And so with that, I think I have time for questions and be happy to answer them. But first, I do want to mention, sorry, that I've had a lot of help from a number of people. As I mentioned, Cameron Britton and the Habitat group here have been a real key in terms of our, bag, our shell bagging efforts and building the reefs, as well as Dr. John Carroll at Georgia Southern helping us out, John Pelly. Um, with uh, Marine Extension was a big help, as well as Jim Nettles, another grad student at Savannah State. I've had help from an undergrad, Maya Clark, at Savannah State Sampling. With our acoustic imaging, we've had Dr. Jim Morley and Dr. Kim Ball at, uh, from South Carolina that have been um, key in helping us kind of dial in our acoustic camera sampling, as well as kind of just the logistics of, of sampling with that, as well as Dr. Morley allowing us to borrow his pretty expensive unit. Um, and then a uh, big help has been Dr. Clark Alexander's group, Mike and Claudia have been a big help with our aerial survey as well as some of the reef site selection that we've done. And then last but not least, thanks to the CIG program for providing funding for this project. So with that, be glad to take any questions you have or have any discussion. Thank you guys for being here.